to hear Professor Lisa Wadowitz, who's a brand new <laughs> associate professor of history and environmental studies at Linfield College in Oregon. And professor Wadowitz is talk is not only exactly about this region, but actually draws on research that she did in part in Bellingham many years ago <laughs> on the ecological effects of creating a cultural and political about borders on what's been a critical history for a long time. <laughs> and her talk will explore both the Aboriginal history and the more recent history of Canadian and American fights over salmon in Salish Sea waters. <laughs> Professor Wadowitz attended Pomona College of California, and for people with interest in East Asian studies, she actually majored in Asian studies um, with a focus on Japanese history and Japanese language, which will help her in her next project, now that this book um, called The Nature of Borders has been completed. Uh, her new research focuses on the history of Pacific whaling um, and the emergence of Pacific world prior to the US's military expansion of the Pacific Ocean in the late 19th century. Uh, as well as um, The Nature of Borders, which is still pretty much a brand new book, right? Professor um, Roberts has published articles in the Pacific Historical Review and Environmental History, and chapters in anthologies on the environmental, cultural, political history of borders, uh, books published by Duke University Press and the University of Nebraska Press. So welcome to Lisa Wadowitz, um, and there'll be time after the talk for some questions as well. I'm not Lisa Wadowitz, my name is Steve Bailey, and I'm the Huxley Collie Coordinator for the Speaker Series. And I just want to mention, so that Dr. Wadowitz knows and everyone else knows, that we're not just rude people. There are 14 people who are taking this as a one credit class, and some of them may have to leave at 4.50 if they have 5 o'clock classes. So if you see people marching out, we're not being impolite. I mean, I'm not <laughs> going to do that, but if you see us who have to leave at that point, that's the reason why. But thank you for coming. Okay, thank you very much. So I went, it's not that I've offended people in the room. Uh, and thank you to the Huxley Center, or college, excuse me, and then also to the history department and to Jen for helping to organize this and make this happen. And thank you all for being here. This a lot of extra credit, I think, being offered today. Um, <laughs> this is great. <laughs> but thank you all for coming. Um, so as Jen mentioned, the title of my talk today is the same as my book, which is quite new. It still feels very new. Uh, it just came out in July. Um, and the title is The Nature of Borders, Salmon Boundaries and Bandits in the Salish Sea. So I'm going to start in the summer of 1895. Uh, George Weber, who was a U.S. Customs Inspector, at Point Roberts, which is this weird little peninsula, right, that sticks down into Washington state waters from Canada. I'll show you some maps of that here shortly. He was a U.S. Customs Inspector appointed there, and he was a very chatty letter writer, which is the type of uh, historical actors that historians love, right? Uh, he was very exasperated with Canadian border crossers in the 1890s. And what he was mostly exasperated about was that the Canadian vessels would come across the border in order to take salmon in American waters. Quote, if you try to get to them, he wrote of the Canadian vessels, they will steam away for a hundred yards across the line and then lay and laugh at you, unquote. The only way to catch them, Weber advised his superiors, was to, quote, to wait your chance and the first time you can get aboard them in American waters to make the seizure, unquote. Weber's laments echoed repeatedly from his perch in the salmon-rich waters of Puget Sound. In his struggles to uphold the U.S. customs laws and to protect this American fishery from Canadian depredations, Weber and his co-workers regularly witnessed illegal border crossings for salmon. Weber's experiences with the Canadian fishing vessels at the turn of the last century highlight the prominent role that the U.S.-Canadian border came to play for the swiftly changing salmon fishing industry and its increasingly diverse workforce. Oops, okay. So as you all no doubt know, being good Pacific Northwestern residents, uh, Pacific salmon are anadromous, meaning that they spend most of their lives out in the ocean before making their way back to their natal streams to spawn and die. Nearly all of the sockeye salmon taken in Washington state hail from the Fraser River tributaries of southwestern British Columbia. The other types of salmon suitable for canning return to rivers on either side of the border. 
Both countries thus have access to this mobile resource in the waters of the Puget Sound slash Georgia Basin, the Strait of Juan de Fuca, and the broader Pacific Ocean. Many scientists, scholars, and local residents have very recently started referring to these contiguous waters as the Salish Sea uh, to basically nod to that this is you know, a joined uh, ecosystem and also a nod to the Coast Salish peoples who made this region their home. So looking out over the Salish Sea, it's very easy to forget that it is bisected by an international political border, and it has been since the mid-19th century. The Canada-U.S. border is invisible to orcas, birds, salmon, uh, and people, but it's very much there. And it's played a very critical role in the history of this fisheries, in the history, history of this fishery. So when I started this project, I set out to research the impact of that border, the modern border, on this transnational fish. But as I delved more deeply into my research, I soon realized that the Canada-US border was not the only border of consequence in this fishery's history. Other, lesser known types of borders drawn by the region's native people in the pre and early contact periods are also an important part of the story. My book is thus a study of the relationships between political conceptions of space and the ways that people have exploited and managed the salmon fishery for centuries. It is, as the book title indicates, about the nature of borders, how borders work, and with what environmental consequences. So at the time I started my research as a graduate student, very few environmental historians had taken mobile resources seriously. Scholars knew that different types of creatures and natural resources move uh, and cross human boundaries at will. But the academy was not, and in many ways still is not, really set up to encourage transnational approaches to history. Most US-based studies stopped at the international border because that's where American historians' expertise ended. Similarly, in the realm of borderlands history, few scholars had dealt with the US-Canada border, and that's since been changing significantly. Uh, and even fewer had written about aquatic borderlands. The time seemed ripe to fill this void. So what I found was this. While the borders constructed by Native Americans evolved to conserve salmon, the border between the United States and Canada had the opposite effect. Both nations quickly discovered that drawing and maintaining an international border at sea was fraught with political, economic, and environmental difficulties. As the canned salmon industry boomed at the turn of the last century, fishery workers of all ethnicities learned how to use the jurisdictional divide created by the border, the international border, to their benefit. Salmon smuggling, fish pirating, and other types of illegal border crossings soon became endemic to the region. Now, this may all sound like a good story, and it is, but these events are important because these illegal border crossings and fish thievery uh, created a messy, contested fishery that heightened suspicions across the border and hindered diplomatic discussions about shared salmon conservation efforts. A transnational view of this fishery's history is thus essential for understanding how so many of the runs from this region remain on the endangered species list. So today in my talk, I'd like to talk briefly about the native fishery border system and how it worked and how resilient it was uh, in the face of tremendous changes in native societies at the time of contact. And then in the second part of my talk today, I'll give you a brief overview of what, who these fish pirates were and what motivated them and with what consequences then their actions had for the salmon of the Salish Sea. So, what do we know about the pre-contact period? Not a lot. Roughly 5,000 years before the present, environmental conditions in the Northwest stabilized and salmon gradually became a more important food item for the people in this region. Over time, Northwest native peoples developed the ca capacity to catch and process millions of salmon each year. They developed very sophisticated ways to provide for their communities, but they, evolved, they also evolved a very special kind of relationship with this important fish. The relationship with salmon grew so valuable that in essence I like to talk about it as the skeleton around which Northwest Native peoples built their communities and their cultural customs. 
Although pre-contact native peoples likely could have done serious damage to their salmon fishery, given the efficiency of their equipment, they instead came to manage their fishery in a sustainable way. And the question I sought to answer is how? How did they do this and, and what motivated them? And part of the answer I found lies in changes in native social practices about two to 3,000 years ago. Around that time, what scholars, and in this case mostly archaeologists, uh, what they think were relatively egalitarian communities, began to divide their villages into distinct social categories. So the Coast Salish separated themselves into a large upper class group, a small lower class group, and a group of slaves. The move toward a more unequal community structure appears to have coincided with changes in salmon fishery management practices and the ability to dry and store salmon for future use. Unless the salmon run failed, they're predictable, right? You know where to go to, to get them. So Northwest Native peoples knew when and where they could obtain this valuable food source. So claiming lucrative locations and preventing others from using those locations makes a certain amount of sense, if you think about it. Limiting the management of productive fishing locations to a few families or individuals could also make it easier to avoid overfishing because you had a clear uh, authority, right, in charge. Because all Northwest Indian groups had customs about sharing food, with neighbors and relatives, it may have been in everyone's interest to surrender management to a small number of people. Well, the details are a little sketchy, but essentially emerged was a border system of restricted access, access privileges, and fishing site ownership practices. So ownership of resource locations meant different things in different communities. At the most basic level, ownership translated into the outright possession of a site when its most valuable resource was available. So for instance, um, for the groups closest to the Salish Sea, exclusive ownership of a fishing location varied according to season, production level, and related labor requirements. So the reef net is one example of uh, a very complex fishing system. So this is a drawing looking down on a reef net. These are canoes. And as you can see, this is the net portion. It's very large, right? And this was back in the day when they were making nets by hand, by spinning um, metal, right? Very time-consuming process. So what a lot of the Coast Salish groups would do is they would involve the entire community in piecing together the net and the equipment, but where the equipment was used was actually an owned site. Okay, so it was heritable. It was passed down through generations of families. And nobody else could use that site, but they could help the owner of the site fish that location. So reef nets were very popular through the San Juan Islands and especially up, see that's Point Roberts there that dips below the, the border, especially up in that area. And they were incredibly productive. This is one of the few photographs we actually have of the Lummi uh, Indians reef netting for salmon at Lummi Island. Dip net platforms would also be owned by individuals or families depending on the community. So again, this fishing wear covers a whole river, right? So it's a, there's a lot of labor involved in building this uh, each season and that the whole community would pitch in. But then these really lucrative locations, like where these people are standing to use a dip net to scoop the salmon out, those would be owned by individuals or families. So the owners of these sites then controlled who could use them, uh, and in the process restricted how many fish were taken from these locations. So in addition to restricting access, native peoples also took many other steps to ensure adequate escapement of spawning salmon. They built fishing equipment so that there were always ways for some fish to reach upstream. So there'd be holes in the bottom of the fishing weir so that some salmon could get by, get by. Over time, they also developed spiritual beliefs, rituals, and moral codes <coughs> that guided how Northwest natives treated this most important fish. So the first salmon caught had to be prepared in a, in a certain way. You've probably heard about the first salmon ceremony among Northwest Native peoples. And specific rules determined who could come into, into contact with the fish and when. 
Now, there were, as with any laws or rules, there were undoubtedly instances of non-compliance. Um, but every member of the village was supposed to act properly so that the fish would come again the following year. So these, these customs were not necessarily then self-conscious acts of conservation, but they promoted respect for salmon, discouraged waste, limited overall fishing, and appear to have kept the salmon fisheries abundant. So when the first European and, and Euro-Americans visitors arrived on the Pacific coast in the 1770s and 1780s, they were mostly interested in trading for animal pelts, not salmon. But as the maritime trade transitioned to the land-based fur trade of the early 1800s, white newcomers grew increasingly interested in this regional fish. So when I started this project, I began reading these fur trader diaries from this period and was immediately struck by how much salmon they ate, but how little salmon fishing they did. They got all of their salmon, almost all, from Northwest Native peoples. The Indians remained in firm control of, this, of their salmon fisheries in this period. And this was especially surprising to me because this is the same time that native communities are being ravaged by exotic diseases, right? So at the very same time that the Hudson's Bay Company, the premier fur trading company, was moving into this area, uh, the Native Americans in this region were able to maintain firm control of this trade and of their salmon fishery. So why was it such a priority, given everything else, else that was going on in their lives at that time? So I dug a little deeper. From the beginning of contact, many regional Indians worried about the impact that mites might have on their relationship with salmon. In numerous instances throughout the Northwest, Native people articulated their concerns and forced newcomers to abide by Indian rules about how to treat salmon and when the fish could be consumed. <clears throat> so the adventurer Alexander Mackenzie, who journeyed down the Bella Coola River in northern British Columbia in 1793, his journals are fascinating reading, by the way, if you're looking for some light summer reading. Um, I mean, he's really clueless. He, he makes repeated uh, cultural faux pas as he journeys down the river. I mean, they should have maybe named the river Faux Pas River or something, because it's, it's just uh, pretty astonishing. So at one village, one of Mackenzie's men tossed a deer bone sort of nonchalantly into the river, and immediately one of the local natives dove in, got that bone, and got it out of the river, and it's like, dude, you know, what are you doing? Uh, and they said, they told Mackenzie that the salmon might take offense by this smell, this venison, right? And, quote, abandon them so that he, his friends, and relations must starve, unquote. And Mackenzie, kind of clueless, continued to inquire about uh, trading for fresh salmon. Uh, the man he was talking to would only offer him cooked salmon uh, that had already been prepared. And then he also was simultaneously kind of encouraging Mackenzie to continue on downriver because they didn't really want him to hang out any longer in case he might uh, make further offense. Many Indians continued to force whites to consume and prepare salmon in particular ways for decades following Mackenzie's journey. So just a couple of examples. Uh, in 1811, Walali, a, a chief at Fort Astoria, near Fort Astoria, refused outright to sell or give any fall salmon to the fur traders. Quote, until a certain time of the moon on account of some superstitious idea, unquote, in the words of a fur trader. A week later, Walali relented briefly that would, only, that would allow the fort only 10 salmon that had already been prepared and roasted. Another fur trader named David Thompson, uh, his party repeatedly tried to buy salmon from Indians on the Columbia River uh, in the summer of 1811, but they simply, quote, gave us surly looks and nothing we could offer would induce them to let us have a single fish, unquote. In another encounter, the Chinook Indians initially brought uh, just a small number of salmon to the traders at Fort Astoria because they were afraid the whites would cut the fish the wrong way and also eat them after dark, which was taboo. Uh, the fur trader Archibald MacDonald, his attempts to purchase early season salmon near Fort Langley, which is on the Fraser River in contemporary British Columbia, uh, in 1829 also met with little success until the natives deemed it safe. While some of the Indians brought him a few raw salmon, he reported that, quote, the natives here, 
also like those in the Columbia and indeed all over, think it's sacrilege to give them otherwise to the whites at first, unquote. So another curious issue here was the issue of fishing nets. The Hudson's Bay Company men, the only Hudson's Bay Company men who appear to have fished for themselves on a, periodically were the men who were stationed at Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River. All of the other traders north of the Columbia repeatedly lamented their dependence on the Indians for fish, their lack of good fishing gear, and their lack of fishing skill. Northwest natives did not sell nets to the Hudson's Bay Company men, and the fur traders reported only having homemade nets consisting of imported twine and old Indian nets that had been sent up from the Columbia River. The company frequently hired Indians uh, for large or labor-intensive projects in and around the forts, uh, and they occasionally paid native fishermen to fish directly for them, but there's no indication that the fur traders considered hiring or even approaching Indians to make nets or to sell nets to the forts. This is curious. So the Indians obviously have an, econo an economic motive here, right? Uh, the fur traders are their, their best customers, so why make nets for them or give them the means to catch their own fish uh, if you've got a captive market? Uh, and the emphasis that the Indians placed on material possessions and status also must have encouraged their desire to stay in control of the salmon trade. Still, based on what we know about the relationship of Northwest Indians to salmon, Native peoples likely also had reasons that were not just rooted in economics. It seems reasonable that regional Indians limited newcomer access to fresh salmon because of the importance that Natives placed on uh, honoring and protecting salmon to ensure their annual return. Salmon were important figures in the Indians' spiritual worldview, and there were very specific rules of behavior regarding their treatment. Why should the Indians trust whites to perform these rituals properly? The connections that Indians drew between the presence of whites and the diseases that ravaged the native population were also significant. From the period of first contact, many native peoples understandably associated the epidemics with the new people in their midst and they reacted accordingly. The Sklalem on the Olympic Peninsula, Washington State, believed a trading vessel that arrived in the region was a spirit that introduced illness. In the north, the Haida came to believe in a spirit of pestilence sometime in the late 1700s, and both they and the Clinket explicitly linked diseases with ships. Many other Indian groups clearly blamed the Hudson's Bay Company for the diseases that afflicted their communities. Now, most Northwest Native groups would not allow anyone that they deemed impure or in possession of unusually strong spirit powers access to their salmon fishery because it could upset the fish and threaten their return. Usually, the Indians associated such powers with puberty, uh, menstruation, birth, or death, but it is possible that the connections between whites and disease prevent, presented a new threat. And really, why risk it? What could, be, what could possibly happen? If angered, most regional Indians believe that salmon could take revenge. Uh, the Clinket and the Sklallam both tell stories in which salmon actually inflict death for insults committed against them. Other groups believed salmon, if displeased, could make the Indians sick. So in 1896, there's an elderly Squamish tribal historian uh, who related a story about his tribe's first encounters with smallpox. The disease started with their salmon, which were infested with running sores and blotches, but the people had to catch them and eat them in the winter as they had no other food. Soon everyone had, quote, a dreadful skin disease loathsome to look upon, and none were spared. Camp after camp, village after village was left desolate. Now, other scholars have interpreted this story as being about a past epidemic experience. Perhaps it was warning of another form of retribution. If Northwest Natives allowed disease-ridden whites to have contact with their salmon fishery, then the offended salmon might bring more epidemics to punish the Indians. Or perhaps the fish would retaliate even further and simply disappear. No salmon can mean the difference between life and death for many of the region's native peoples. So, as the 19th century progressed, and the commercial canned salmon industry boomed in the 1890s and early 1900s, the strength and viability of this native border system broke down. 
Aid of labor was initially crucial to the early canning establish the establishments that were um, built on both sides of the international border in Puget Sound and British Columbia, but they were very quickly pushed out of the industry and only a small number of them continued to find work uh, in the growing industry by the early 1900s. Now I don't have time today because there are limitations on, on our time together, but I just wanted to give you a brief overview of what that process looked like, uh, really literally looked like. Um, there's a whole chapter in the book that details how this unfolded over time. Uh, so if you're interested in these issues, it's chapter three. Uh, so take a look. Um, but basically I'm going to show you these visuals. I found two really great sets of maps in my research. The first of these maps drawn by Wayne Suttles, who's an anthropologist who interviewed Native peoples, uh, Coast Salish peoples, in the 1940s and 1950s. And he drew these very detailed map by, maps by hand where he interviewed elderly tribal members around the region and noted all their <laughs> resource procurement sites here, these little notations, you don't have to know exactly which ones are which, and there are important village sites and camps. And you can see his handwriting here, all in here. The second set of maps are these Washington State Department of Fish and Game maps that are in really poor quality on microfilm in the state archives in Olympia. And they don't match up exactly, but enough of them do, uh, that will show you where Native peoples used to get their resources right, in the early contact era per period. And by the early 1900s, where are all the fish traps, these huge structures, that really efficient structures I'll talk more about in a minute when we get to fish pirates, uh, where those were built are directly on top of the Native American sites. So let me just, I'll try to point these out to you. I think you'll get an idea. So if you see it all along the west coast of San Juan Island, and this area actually comes to be known as the Salmon Banks, if anybody's been to San Juan Island. Very lucrative salmon fishing grounds. And you see, that's where the Songish used to fish. And also here, there's some notations. It's a little harder, a little lighter to see. There's clams and other sockeye and halibut, other fish around Orcas Island. And now let's juxtapose that with the state department maps. These are the originals, which as you can tell, not good enough quality to go into a book. So <laughs> I had to pay a cartographer to reproduce them. But see all along here, up around Orcas. And here specifically, if you look, look at Cyprus, and unfortunately there's, there's more down here that doesn't show up on the Suttles maps, but Cyprus and Guemus Island. And all the way down Whidbey Island, these are all, these little barrel looking things are all fish traps. And this doesn't even count the saners and the gillnetters, right, who are also out there fishing. And you'll notice the groupings right around the Indian reservations, the Swinomish Indian Reservation, they were forced to retreat to their reserves in order to fish at all, only in the rivers. And here's, this is just the territory of the Semiamu because he split it up according to group, but many other groups would lay claim to reef net locations here. So this is a little deceptive. There's many more fish, fishing sites here than show up in this map. But you see, again, sturgeon, salmon, different species of salmon. And then this is what the border region looked like by the early 1900s. So Canada repeatedly tries to buy Point Roberts from the United States, because it makes sense, right? Uh, but it became such a lucrative fishing location, the United States was like, oh, no thank you, we'll just keep it, right? Because they wanted their fishermen to be able to benefit from that. So situating these maps side by side reveals a fishery completely transformed, right? For the benefit of white commercial fishery in interests and at the expense of the region's native peoples by the 19-teens. So now let's shift gears into the commercial fishery that really um, grows up in the 1890s and early 1900s. Uh, so as this business rose in profitability, government agents, canners, and local laborers began to pay closer attention to the legal, uh, jurisdictional, legal and jurisdictional implications of the Anglo-American border. The 1846 treaty between the U.S. and Great Britain drew, uh, determined that the border ran down the middle of the Strait of Juan de Fuca, 
and in 1872 ruling uh, then established the border's circuitous path through the San Juan Islands. Government officials soon determined that no Americans could fish below that line, Canadians could not fish above it, and given the racist assumptions of the times, Asian fishery workers on either side would be met with suspicion pretty much no matter what. So fishing over the line and getting caught could result in a boat seizure, a fine, or potentially, and this did happen on occasion, an international diplomatic incident. So the imposition of the Anglo-American border was a colonial act completely divorced from issues of salmon conservation and consumption control. Instead, this new border created a spatially, politically, and economically bifurcated fishery that defied easy regulation. Regional fish packers worried about the growing numbers of white and Japanese fishermen selling salmon to their competitors across the line. And because the canners, were, who were often also the fish trap owners, they tended to be the same corporations, uh, because they frequently provided boats and gear to fishermen, who then signed a contract promising that they'd bring their catch back to that particular establishment, uh, the canners claimed that it was a breach of contract when the fishermen sold their salmon to a different cannery. So fish piracy, uh, which I'll explain here in a second, threatened the canner's hold then on the regional fish supply. And I should just pause here and mention again, um, this story is very complex and there's a whole chapter that looks at legitimate fishermen, fishermen who are firmly ensconced in the industry as wage laborers negotiating with the canners, um, how they too were able to use the international border to, to um, you know, kind of uh, make a case to the canners and try and uh, make more money than they would have otherwise. They manipulated that economic, that jurisdictional and economic um, divide for their own benefits. And these would be uh, workers who worked within the industry itself. And the people I'm going to talk about now, today, are essentially uh, workers who left the industry pretty much entirely, or maybe they'd go back and fish occasionally for wage labor, but a lot of times they just decided to go off on their own and live a life on the edge of the law. And the locals and they themselves referred to themselves as fish pirates. So first you need to know what a fish trap looks like more than those little marks on a map. Um, so this is you know, sort of a slightly romantic drawing. I'll show you some actual photographs here in a second. But these wooden pilings, right, are driven down into the ocean floor uh, and then hung with nets. So they essentially create these walls of net that direct salmon. They're built in very clever places to take advantage of the current, right, because salmon swim with the currents. And they have to be very sturdy because of the weather and, and other things. Uh, so then they direct the salmon in to a smaller and smaller place where they end up into what's known as a spiller. And they're still alive, they're in the water, right? So this is pretty ingenious. It's a way to entrap thousands, if not millions of salmon, but they're still alive, so you can then time, uh, if you're a canner that owns one of these structures, you can time when you take the fish out and take them to the cannery to have them processed. So, as you can see, they could be quite large and elaborate structures, and they became quite expensive. And somewhat ironically, the, the beauty of these fish traps, the fact that they trap so much fish in one place uh, so efficiently, uh, was exactly what fish pirates took advantage of. So they would pull up here under cover of night and scoop out fish and then sneak away and go sell them someplace. And the competition for fish was often so intense, they were usually able to do pretty well for themselves. So you can kind of get an idea of how many fish we're talking about. So each one of these uh, would, each one of these traps, and you saw how many there were, right, on those maps, could catch thousands if not millions of fish, depending on the size of the run each season. So men like Burt Jones, who's one of my favorite fish pirates, um, he might quietly set out from one of the many small west coast towns like, oh, I don't know, Anacortes or Bellingham, and uh, sneak out to these fish traps in order to steal salmon. Quote, I'd keep hid during the day and come out during the evening after the patrol boats had all left, Bert Jones remembered. The nighttime was when I'd done my work, and they'd done theirs in the daytime. Oh, the fish traps was thick. God, they were thick. Every night I used to get a load of fish, unquote. So like other fishery, other fishery workers, as I mentioned, um, fish pirates quite successfully exploded, exploited the jurisdictional and economic divisions created by the international border. 
Uh, instead of just describing or listing off some of their deeds, um, which is interesting, but I thought it might be more fun to show you some of the sources that I used. Uh, these newspaper clippings that some very uh, dutiful and um, thorough individual in the 1890s and early 1900s cut out of regional newspapers and they're housed at the University of British Columbia now. So what fish piracy did is it made the competition for fish more intense, right? Because nobody really knew quite where they were going to end up. Uh, and what it also did, and I hope these, some of these headlines will give you a sense of, don't try and read all the fine print, it's <laughs> the quality's not good enough for that, but I'll just highlight a few things, uh, is it fanned the flames of international rivalry between the Canadian and American fishermen. And so you can see in a lot of these headlines that the fish trap owners are sure that, you know, the American fish trap owners are sure that it was Canadian uh, thieves who snuck down below the border and stole their fish and took them back across the border and vice versa. And uh, oftentimes they had no idea, but this was a way to blame somebody, right? So, and vicious audacity and words like this are in a lot of these uh, <laughs> early 1900s, 1890s uh, newspapers. Again, audacious fish robbers hold up traps. So here you have the pirate sloop off the Fraser River, um, picked up a good cargo of salmon and discharged at Point Roberts. So of course canners are um, seem seemingly powerless to prevent the depredations. Which, in fact, they had a whole patrol that they funded themselves that were armed and dangerous. There was a lot of violence involved in this. So, of course, the fish pirates must have come from the Fraser River. So it was those dastardly Canadians sneaking down below the border and wreaking havoc on American fish traps. So the story from Bellingham, they thought uh, Canadian canners then also um, were using... Sorry? To be an excuse to keep people away from the, the traps. So they tried to regulate that. It's not entirely clear there, but here again they're checking poachers from the United States in Canada. That's the British colonist newspaper. And this is my favorite, so I saved it for last. Uh, Forty desperados from the north swooped down on American fisheries, of course, and blood-curdling yarn of salmon piracy. <laughs> So uh, many fish pirates remained undetected and they just snuck in and, and stole the fish. Um, but a lot of them actually just ended up um, bribing the trap watchmen that the canners and the trap owners would hire to, to keep watch on their traps. But they paid them so poorly that it was the bribes from the fish pirates are actually quite uh, convincing. And they often work together with fish pirates. So there was, as I mentioned, I don't have time to go into a lot of detail, but this, as you can imagine, lent itself. All these people are armed and patrolling and uh, out there at these fish traps. There were a lot of violent incidents in this, these uh, two to three decades where fish piracy was quite common. So why did they do it? Why did these guys go out and risk life at the edge of the law, risk getting arrested uh, or fined? And obviously, it was lucrative, right? They made money. On average, fish pirates made more than legitimate fishermen. Uh, Bert Jones used his fish poaching income to build his family's home, to travel, and when he was interviewed in 1978, he bragged that he still had about $20,000 in the bank from his fish poaching days. Um, other fish wrestlers did quite well for themselves. Red Custer, who was, they all had nicknames, right? Red Custer was one of the region's most notorious fish pirates, uh, and he made a very comfortable living from poaching. According to one former trap owner, Custer, quote, would pirate for three months out of the year and the rest of the time he had enough money to live real nice, unquote. So the fish pirates, undoubtedly the money was appealing, right? But the fish pirates also seem to have understood that fish traps and the regulations governing them granted their privileged owners control over two precious commodities in this western waterscape, salmon and space. Because building and operating traps was very expensive, uh, they were beyond the financial means of ordinary fishermen, right? Uh, they really only belonged to the wealthiest people involved in this industry. And by the late 1890s, some of these fish traps were going for twenty to $90,000 a piece. So this took a lot of financial outlay to, to build a viable trap. 
There's our trap watchman. That's the only photograph of them, of any trap watchman I've been able to find. I don't know if they were bribed, but... <laughs> and I got ahead of myself here on the slides. And the canners who tried to restrict them. There's lots of pictures of the canners, very few pictures of the workers themselves. So, not only were they expensive, but these traps also monopolize huge amounts of coastal fishing space. So you can see here these leads, right, that go out into the ocean. And some of these pilings are still out there. You've probably seen them. Uh, they were outlawed in 1934. Um, but the trap owners would build the traps specifically to create these large sprawling structures that uh, jutted out from the coast, way out into coastal fishing waters. And prior to government regulation, uh, trap owners commonly strung their traps together to blockade huge sections of water. Uh, in 1895, uh, government officials discovered three such structures linked together that extended a mile out into, the, into coastal waters from Point Roberts. So Washington State finally began to regulate traps in 1897, but the trap owners were very clever. And what they did is they basically, they adhered to the law, right, laws that were meant to actually conserve salmon and space out traps, et cetera. Um, but they took advantage of every little loophole and they built experimental traps that were like temporary. And they built dummy traps that were not really catching fish. Uh, and they would openly talk about maintaining some traps just to protect other ones that were really lucrative. And sometimes they calculated that if they got caught and fined, it was worth it because they'd make so much money from the fish, it didn't matter. So, fish pirates and other local residents in interviews decades after the fact recalled that salmon thieves specifically targeted only the traps owned by the wealthiest industry players, usually large corporations like Pacific American Fisheries or the Bellingham Canning Company. Quote, actually, one former industry player mused, quote, they were like some people, radical people are today. There are some people say, that is government, I'll take all I can get. They are throwing the money away anyway. They would talk like that about the big companies. The companies are making a killing, it won't hurt them be good to get some of their fish. That was the attitude, unquote. So the trap owners acted all aghast, right, at, at fish thievery and fish pirates, but they themselves were guilty of doing similar things. They not only hired some fish pirates to steal from their competitors' traps, they also, um, they also fished illegally themselves. They would pay their trap watchmen to fish during the closed time when the traps weren't supposed to be operating. Uh, so Bert Jones again admitted you know, I used to be a crook, he said, but I wasn't any more crooked than they were. They fished their traps during the closed time and were just as bad as me. He said, if they start to steal the fish out of season, I'll have a little hand in it myself, unquote. So fish pirates tra tapped into this progressive era, uh, concerns about scientific management, natural resource conservation, and wastefulness to justify their activities. They frequently aligned themselves with the causes of conservation in their complaints about the large trap and cannery owners as wasteful villains. And fish pirates, they implied, you know, were supporters of conservation whose access to the fishing commons had just been wrongfully curbed. So this also gives you a sense of how far out from the coast there some of these leads could be. So the question of trap wastefulness is not easily answered, and there's a lot of arguments pro and con. Um, but raising that question, which the fish pirates did, deflects from the larger question of wastefulness in general. Rampant waste did plague the Salish Sea fishery at the turn of the 20th century, but everyone played their part, including fish pirates. Fish trap operators had the potential to limit how many fish they removed from their traps and roughly balance trap removals with the cannery's capacity to process them. Fish pirating, however, potentially upset that balance and introduced additional salmon to the region's processing facilities that may well have added to the oversupply on the docks. Trap owners fished illegally, cannery operators wasted fish, and fishermen pursued salmon with ever-efficient gear farther from shore and out onto the high seas. Few in the industry had any incentive to abide by fishing regulations or conserve salmon, so few did. 
So fish pirates stole fish to make money and capitalize on local class solidarity to avoid capture and censure. Still, their efforts to cast themselves as the antithesis of the trap owners were not borne out by their ongoing poaching activities. Instead, fish pirates introduced new ways to fish salmon irresponsibly and in the process created additional hassles for fishery regulators. So to conclude, the US and Canada realized, it seems pretty clear if you, if you look at the map, uh, that joint regulation of their shared fishery was the only way to implement effective conservation laws, and they actually began negotiations in the 1890s. However, the rise of all this stuff, this border banditry, this illegal f border crossings, and fish piracy wrought havoc on early diplomatic negotiations, and competition for fish repeatedly derailed talk about an international salmon conservation treaty. Then, of course, you had pollution dams, irrigation systems, uh, habitat destruction caused by the growth of industry and urbanization, uh, all continued to negatively impact salmon habitat. <clears throat> A 1913 rock slide at Hell's Gate on the Fraser River uh, further complicated the situation and endangered runs of pink and sockeye salmon. So by 1918, the US and Canada faced one another across the 49th parallel and perhaps for the very first time truly realized how Pacific salmon both united and divided them. Both countries returned to the negotiating table after World War I, but persistent infighting delayed agreement on a system of joint management until the passage of the 1937 Sockeye Salmon Convention. Human borders have always mattered to the salmon populations that spawn in the waterways of the Salish Sea. Northwest indigenous peoples demarcated space with attention to salmon availability, and native borders and related customs constrained excessive salmon harvesting. In contrast, white newcomers drew borders that revealed the cultural and economic marginalization of salmon. Border banditry, fish piracy, and other illegal border crossings granted regional fishermen and fish workers opportunities for higher catches, additional income, and better wages. And fishermen of all ethnicities took advantage of this jurisdictional outlet created by the border. As a result, the system's porosity fostered mistrust and sharpened competition across the 49th parallel. But these diverging geographies in the Salish Sea are really fundamental to understanding both the sustainability and the decline of the Fraser River runs over time. So in short, borders have both helped and hindered human attempts to manage this fishery for maximum benefit. This tale of decline is perhaps most surprising given the lessons embedded in the deeper re reaches of this fisheries history. As some fishery managers are learning of late, certain types of management approaches can lead to more sustainable fishing practices. Dividing fishing space into discrete management areas that are small enough to be patrolled effectively is one. More carefully limiting the number of fishermen allowed out on the grounds is two. Uh, and more strictly regulating the total number of fish caught. These are all management approaches in various fisheries, including salmon ones, that are showing signs of success. These all sound a little bit familiar, right? In an interesting twist, these emerging methods look suspiciously like those that prevailed in Northwest Indian communities in the pre and early contact eras. Such practices will not benefit everyone equally, but perhaps, as Native peoples once discovered, that's the price of managing salmon sustainably. The view from the Salish Sea on a sunny day I know we haven't seen one in a while, but it's capable of seducing even the most skeptical observer that these waters need wild Pacific salmon. The long contested, contested history of this fishery shows us that despite the many missteps there have been along the way, uh, perhaps this goal is achievable after all. The lessons are there, but whether or not we will heed them remains to be seen. So thank you very much for your patience and for coming.